Our hope is in Jesus. This morning, I'm gonna ask you, those of you welcome, it's so good to have you joining us online. I'm gonna ask you to go online and under the other line to give and to mark Priscilla. If you can't spell Priscilla, just write Prissy. Prissy. That was my, one of my junior high first girlfriends was Prissy. We're still a good friends uh, today. And uh, let's bless the socks off of her, get her on that mission field as fast as we can. And uh, she's at 35% of her monthly budget, and we're believing to get her there 100%. And we want to partner with you, Priscilla, and we're so glad. And when I, I'm on the World Missions Board, and I was part of interviewing Priscilla uh, in Springfield back in March when she received her full appointment to go forward. And, and I'm proud of you, Priscilla. And your story rocks me, and I know you're so sincere and you're full of God, and I know that Jesus is going to use you. One thing she didn't tell you, after she got saved, delivered, she was discipled in her church and began to serve so much so that this church that where she served hired her own staff as a pastor and has been serving there for several years as a pastor. So I'm thankful for Priscilla. I'm thankful for our missionaries, and I'm thankful for a church that has a heart to give. Did you know that over the months, the first six months of the year, I haven't gotten July report, but through June, that missions is up over last year. Tithing is up over last year. Benevolence is up over last year. And guess what? We're not called, the people of God, we're not called to fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. And, and we're not to shrink back. We're not to just hold on till something blows over. Listen, when there's trouble in the land, the opportunities are ripe for Jesus. Can you say the name Jesus out loud? Everyone say it, Jesus, Jesus. There's hope in the name of Jesus. There's peace in the name of Jesus. There's, there's a faith in the, that rises up in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. There's a joy in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, he is the hope that we have. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah, the master, the savior, the wonderful prince of peace, the counselor, the everlasting father, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not about the assemblies of God. It's not about the pastors. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And Jesus so loved the world. He sent his, that Jesus so loved the world that he went to the cross and God gave his son that whoever believed in Jesus would have life. And today, if you're hopeless, if today you're fearful, if today you feel guilt and shame because of your past, if today you're caught in sin, if today you're in bondage to pornography, if today you're in bondage bondage to some other sexual uh, um, uh, immoral sin. If today you're caught in, 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 the, in the bondage of gambling or in the bondage of some chemical, whatever it might be, Jesus is here to set you free. He has all the power given in his name and heaven and earth. And the authority is in the name of Jesus and we bear his name and we're the children of God. Can you say thank the Lord? Thank you, Jesus, right? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This morning, have the opportunity, and I don't preach from a script. I have a few things written down here, so it's hard for me, uh, like these younger pastors, and I don't know how they memorize it, but I, I, I could go on an hour today, but I'm going to do my best here, okay? But pray for me, because I, I don't, you know, as I get older, my thoughts sometimes wander. So you know how, like when you're preaching, you need to start here and go like this way? Well, I'll just float over, way over on this bank, then back up down that road, and then over here, and I just need to stay on the river, right? I need to stay directed, so help me as I preach and, and pray for me that, I, that I'm able to do that, and you people at home too, and we hope you'll listen and respond. So today the message is ambassadors for Christ as we talk about the uh, uh, the, the characters of the Bible that aren't prominent, that aren't famous, the, the minor characters, the individuals that you don't hear as much about. And today's message is about the couple called Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul loved them. He calls my, my, my helpers, my, my, uh, my the, the, you know, servants of Jesus Christ together with me. And you can see Paul absolutely adored them and the impact that they made they were laity, no one knows it. They were like official, anything but just a couple, just individuals that loved Jesus, found Jesus, they grew up 
that was impacted and impacted many people. They even pastored a church or two along the way. They were always involved in ministry. And so I want to talk about them today. But before I do, I need to give you some background because some of you know this or maybe you've forgotten it. And some of you maybe have never known this, that when Paul wrote the, the letter to the church at Rome, we, it's in the Bible, the book of Romans, okay, Romans. When he wrote that letter, he wrote to the, the, what was going on in that letter. He's writing to what's going on during that cultural time. And uh, <clears throat> Paul is the one that writes to us that we're ambassadors or representatives of Christ to make our appeal, to plead the case for Christ to people to be right with God. And so uh, as Aquila and Priscilla uh, were very impactful in the first century, I want to encourage you that you can be impactful in the first century. And uh, we have problems going on in our country that are, are opportunities, actually. And we don't need to be afraid or shrink back. But I, I, want, I want you to get a hold of the history of what's going on during this time. Because when we read from Acts, it's also shown in Romans because it's shown together. When Paul writes in, in, in Romans, but Acts is written by Luke. And Luke records some of the things that went on that involved Aquila, Priscilla, and Paul. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you what's going on right, in, right at this time that I'm about to read in uh, Acts chapter 18. I want to show you what's going on when this takes place. And that is that uh, there were house churches in Rome. And originally, most of the Christians were Jews in Rome. They weren't in Israel. They were in Rome, the Jews in Rome, a lot of Christians. And they began to reach Gentiles, those who were non-Jewish. And the Gentiles came in, and the gospel was being spread in Rome. And Aquila and Priscilla were living in Rome. Paul was living in Athens. Well, because of the circumstances, both Paul and Athens moved to Corinth, and Aquila and Priscilla moved to Cor Corinth, which is where we get the book Corinthians, right? The Corinth, the Corinthians, the church at Corinth. And so what was happening is in these house churches, most of the people in the house churches were Jewish, but they were mingled more and more Gentiles. And uh, what was happening, they had the Jews that were Christians and the Jews that weren't Christians. They were Old Testament Jews. They had not received Jesus. They did not believe Christ, Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And there was a conflict. And there was quite the disturbance going on in Rome. And the Romans, they didn't want to put up with that. And they were, there was a lot of disturbance going on. And according to uh, one historian by the, by the name of uh, Suetonius, he talks about this conflict that was going on in Rome. And guess what? The Roman emperor, Claudius, has, has an edict, uh, a, a decree that says all the Jews must leave Rome. Now think Aquila and Priscilla, they're tent makers, and they're in Rome, and they're enjoying life. This was in A.D. 49. If you're taking notes, write that down, A.D. 49. Well, Claudius dies five years later in A.D. 54. A.D. 54. All right, so all the Jews that left Rome, both the Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews, Old Testament Jews, they're all gone out of Rome, right? So imagine that pull up. That was, that was, that was quite the event. And... Uh, so Paul's writing the book of Romans with this context that this happened. And the letter that Paul writes to the church at Rome, called we call Romans, was arrived to Rome in the church at Rome in A.D. 57. A.D. 49, all the Jews are run out, Christians and non-Christians. A.D. 54, uh, the uh, uh, Claudius dies. A.D. 57, Paul's letter arrives. And so Paul is writing to the situation of the conflict between the Jews that are Christian, the Jews that aren't Christian, but something else happened. The church continued to thrive once the Jews all left Rome. And during those five years before the Jews began to trickle back in, once the edict was done and Claudius was dead in AD 54, the Jews, Christian Jews started coming back to Rome. Other Jews started coming back to Rome and they all were coming. But guess what they walked into? They walked into a Gentile church. The church of Jesus Christ was mostly Gentile. It felt different. And the Jews were thinking, am I Jewish or am I Christian? And that, that whole thing, like, you know, is this all about circumcision? Is this about the law? It, you know, is Jew, my Jewish uh, right and birth, is that what it's about here? Is it my Christian birth? And they're working this through. So think of this in context And Paul writes. And let me just read down a few verses that, that I have here that I pulled out, and there's a lot of them. In Romans, Paul uses a style of writing where he makes a point by asking questions, 51 questions in the book of Romans. And I'm gonna read some of those. Look at this in chapter three, one in Romans. 
it says, then what advantage has the Jew or what benefit is that of circumcision? In 3, 9, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have all, we, for we have already charged that both the Jews and the Greeks, right, the Gentiles, are all under sin. So you see the, see the, the tension, they're all Christians. You got Gentile Jew Christians and you got Jewish Christians. He's writing to this and he's writing to the Old Testament Jews as well that haven't received Jesus in all of this in Romans. It's an amazing letter he writes in this context, in this context of this history. And he says, look at 329 of Romans. Or is God the God of the Jews only? See, see what he's, see what he's doing? He's asking the question. Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? The 331, do we then nullify the law through faith? This is written to the Jews that might be Old Testament at this point. Do we nullify the law through faith? Because maybe that's what they're trying to indicate. They don't want to take Jesus and the grace and the faith. He says, may it never be. On the contrary, he says, by faith, we establish the law. The law is established. So those of you that think the morals of the Old Testament are outdated and not for today, baloney. Paul says baloney. It's established. Okay, so... Uh, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Again, he's asking a question to those that are, are Jewish by nature, but maybe not Christians. Verse 4, chapter 4, 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? Because the Jews were circumcised. The Gentiles weren't. He's going, does, does circumcision matter? Is the blessing there? Is Jesus for the circumcised? No. Is he for the Gentile? Of course he is. By grace are you saved through faith? Of course he is. He's asking 7-1, or do you not know, brethren? For I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. He's answering the, the, the question of, the, you know, the Gentile Christians that maybe want to throw out the law and just hang on to Jesus and don't understand the authority of the Word of God. Then he says in 930, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? So he addresses that. So that's the context of what we're in. And in the time, Aquila and Priscilla, who we're going to talk about mostly, are in Rome and get kicked out because the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews are battling in the streets. There's conflict, and they don't care about the Jews anyway. You're not even from here. Just get out, Claudius says. Just get out. So they have to pull up, Aquila and Priscilla. They're tent makers, so they pull up stakes and they go and they go to Corinth. Well, at the same time, Paul's moving from Athens to Corinth. Do you think God orchestrated Paul and Priscilla and Aquila to be together? Huh? Absolutely. So the, the, the first thing I want you to see is that uh, God uses difficult seasons and circumstances to advance his plan. This was difficult in Rome. It was difficult for Christians everywhere at the time. In fact, in Acts, it talks about the Christians being dispersed. Then the gospel went forth to every corner because of the persecution. Listen, we have trouble in our land, but God's not absent. This is no time to just hold on and just maintain till it all blows by. It's no time to retreat. It's time to go forward in the name of Jesus because there's hope in Jesus and Jesus is the answer and Jesus is the victory and Jesus is our message, right? It's Jesus. All of Jesus, who's the baptizer of the Spirit, who dwells with you richly in the Word of God. It's Jesus who renews the mind through the Word of God. We need Jesus. He's our hope. Amen? And so these difficult seasons that they, they, they lived in, look at Acts chapter 18, 1 to 4, and you'll see this. After these things, Paul is talking about Paul, and I'm reading NASB, and I think NIV is on the screen. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, just what I told you, the Roman emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, they were both tent makers, Aquila and Paul, quit, they, were, they were both tent makers, they met somehow, God, God orchestrated it, Paul stayed with Aquila and Priscilla. He stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade, they were tent makers. And he was reasoning, Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks about Jesus, of course, right? I want to jump down to verse 11, and it won't be on the screen right this minute, but it says, and he settled there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Paul 
Aquila and Priscilla were there. Now, I'm going to tell you about Priscilla. Her, her name, they, many places they say Prissa. It's a name that came from a wealthy family. And people uh, don't know because it's not written anywhere. They think maybe she came from some wealth, right? Or even some royalty. And that maybe she wasn't Jew. Maybe she wasn't a Jew. Aquila was. Priscilla may have been a Gentile, a Roman. But, he, but he, she's married to Aquila. And they both have to leave. And they come back. Because later that's going to play in of how Aquila and Priscilla saved Paul's life, right? They were brave. They saved the life of the Apostle Paul and others. But they were in some difficult times. They had to pull up, move away. Then Paul comes to Athens and he's looking. He has no money. Paul, the, the, the history showed when he, he was kind of broke. He didn't have anywhere to stay, whatever. He met because of the trade, a tent maker, and they invited him in. They were hospitable. They invited him in and he stayed there, probably except on the couch for a year and a half or somewhere. Maybe, maybe like where Jesus was born, down the lower room where the animals, he may have had a little rack in the animal place there in the house. I don't know. But th there was trouble on every hand. And Paul writes, just to help you understand throughout his life, about the shipwrecking, about the beating, about the threatening of his life, about trying to silence him. And we in America are facing some of the same stuff. But guess what? We will not shut up. We will go forward. We will not give up. We will move forward. We will not be stopped. Jesus Christ will be preached. And Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, talking about the gospel message in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 9. He says, there, there is a message that I've got and we're gonna give it. And he's talking about all of us as ambassadors for Christ. He's talking about all of us as a, a job to whatever our gifts are to get the message of hope of Jesus out to the world and to the lost. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. That gospel, that spirit that saves us, that message is from God, and it's in us. It's changed us. And he talks about the trouble then. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. <laughs> hey, you're right? Does that make sense? Does this ring a bell for the day? We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Not destroyed. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is on the move, and God uses difficult seasons and circumstances to advance his plan. And maybe some of us will die for our faith in Jesus, but the most persecuted nations in the world or where more people by the thousands rapidly are coming to Jesus because the blood of the martyrs of saints that go into the ground fertilizes that ground so that Jesus Christ will be praised. And just let me tell you something. In America someday, pastors will be killed for preaching the gospel and preaching the, the biblical morals that God God is someday in America I expect to see it happen someday in America we're going to put our lives on the line to serve Jesus will you stand up or not stand up will you be afraid or not afraid the perfect love of God cast out fear God loves me perfectly God's love and his spirit's in me the spirit fruit and love and it's there and I'm not going to shrink back I'm going to walk in it and I'm not going to be afraid amen I'm not going to be afraid we don't need to be afraid we move forward and so point one, God uses difficult seasons and circumstances to advance his plan because he got Aquila and Priscilla together with Paul. And boy, did they benefit each other. Second thing is God's plan includes everyone, all of his children. And we recognizing our kingdom calls, our kingdom commission, the commission and call of God. You see, let me tell you something. Pastors are not the ones making a difference in our world. They lead people that make a difference. Do you understand that? The greatest impact in the history of this church has been lay people. Some that still attend here, some that's moved on because God called them on or moved out of town. The impact of your life has got greater impact than I could ever have for anybody because your tent makers, your businessmen, you know, your, your uh, uh, people that, that work driving trucks or, or doctors or, or uh, or teachers or whatever else it might be. You're just regular people, but you're people full of God, full of His Spirit, full of power, full of faith. And you speak words of life and you have words of life. And God has a purpose for you, whatever your gifts are. If you could just recognize your kingdom call and commission, God's plan involves you like it did Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla. Look at Acts 18 verse 11 again. 
it talks about there. Verse 1 to 4, we, we already read, but I'm going to jump to 11. It says, and he settled there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. You're talking about being hospitable. Do you know hospitality is one of the greatest calls of God? Deacons, elders, pastors, to be hospitable, to love, to welcome people into your place of, of your home, to have people over for a dinner, to do whatever, to fellowship with them, to influence them. Can you imagine the benefit Aquila and Priscilla had by being hospitable to Paul? How much did Paul speak into their lives? Can you imagine how Paul benefited from Aquila and Priscilla? I mean, this was amazing. A year and a half. Man, that's a long time for someone to live with you. They talk about relatives coming and after about a week, they, they like fish, they start stinking. You know, it's time to go, you know. And, uh, but this was the Holy Spirit of God upon them. And I'm telling you, that impact of hospitality is great. So you can all be hospitable. Uh, it's, on, it's great for you and those being hosp be, you're being hospitable, hospitable to. And notice also in Acts chapter 18, uh, 18 to 20, it says, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brothers and he put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Chintria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus. Y'all know the book Ephesians? This is Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. And he left them there. Now he, he, he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And verse 20 says, when they asked him to stay longer for a longer time, he did not consent. And he took leave and he, and he went somewhere else. But guess what? Aquila and Priscilla stayed in Ephesus and had a house church and pastored as lay people. That's what happened. You see, they had a, a call and, and, they, and, and you know, they, they, were, they served the Lord with kindness. And then in Acts 18, 24 to 26, jump up. It says, now this is when, how many of you remember Apollos? Remember in Act, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul, Paul uh, writes to the church at Corinth and he says, some of you say you're of Paul. Some of you say you're of Cephas or Peter. Some of you say you're of Apollos. This is Apollos, an evangelist, a fervent preacher of the word. And he says, but we're all of Christ. It's not about us. I, I didn't baptize hardly anybody. It's about Jesus. Remember that? Remember that? Okay, so here, here's, here's this Apollos, and it says here in verse 24, uh, a, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, look, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in scriptures. Now, Aquila and Priscilla are there. Paul's not there right now. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately, according to what he knew, accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted with only the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila, and notice he put Priscilla first there, and three or four times, the, Paul writes and he puts Priscilla first because Deborah was a prophetess. People believe Priscilla could speak better and teach better. Or some think that because she came from a wealthy family, they don't know why. But that, that is not typical New Testament writing. You put a woman's name in front of a man, but it tells you something about Jesus because the Jews were very racist, just like not wanting to accept the Gentiles until they got Jesus. And suddenly the Gentiles were okay to give the gospel to. And they argued over it because they were religious and not full of Christ. And let me tell you something, racism always happens and pray prejudice always happened against women, against the poor, against anyone without Jesus. But when you have Jesus, your eyes don't look that way. I'm telling you right now. And Priscilla and Aquila, uh, it was Priscilla, they heard Apollos preaching and teaching fervently. They took, it says, they took him aside. Look, they didn't say, that's not right. You don't have the whole truth. They didn't get on Facebook or somewhere and chide him publicly. They didn't do that. They weren't mean. They were kind. They privately, they took him aside privately and explained him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren uh, encouraged him to, to and, and wrote to the disciples to welcome him, him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those that believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So you see, Aquila and Priscilla were gracious. They even taught pastors. You know how many people in this church have spoken into my life and taught me things biblically? You know how many lay people? Let me tell you, pastors don't know everything. They have blind spots. The church will never be the church. Will never get anything done without people of God with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead rising up and taking your position because my point 
My point is that God's plan includes everyone, every one of his children recognizing the kingdom call and the kingdom commission for you. And I'm going to tell you, there are people in this church, couples like Ray and Nevi Rowe and many others. I can go down the line, Vic and Lynn Mitchell, I can go right down the line and I'll just stop there. And individuals, single individuals that have impacted more for Jesus and for the people of God than any pastor ever has. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I mean that. The, the greatest impact upon the kingdom of God is regular people like Aquila and Priscilla, full of God's word and full of God's spirit. That's you. That's you. And so it includes everyone. We're all important. They left their comfort behind and they were very impactful. And so the next thing, the third thing is we cannot stay comfortable in our Christianity. We got to take risk. And here's where I mentioned where Paul in Romans chapter 16, he, he talks about how Aquila and Priscilla saved his life as he was at the end of his, his ministry. Let me get to it here. Romans 16, verse 3 and 4, he says this. Greet Prissa. There, there's how, that's what I was saying about why they think that maybe she was a, a Gentile. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of, Gent, of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Okay. A church is in their house. These guys were power players. They took risk. I don't know what they had to save Paul's neck, but something, whether it was influence, whether it was stepping out, whether it was a diversion, we don't know, but they risked their life to save Paul. And Paul was grateful and he was thankful. And let me tell you something, Christianity that's comfortable is not okay. We cannot stay number three comfortable in our Christianity. We have to take risks. Perhaps out of your comfort zone. You know, there were riots going on there in Ephesus at the time. Did you know that? And probably that's what he's referring to. In Acts 19, read about the riots that went on. It had to do with the gods made by hands and, uh, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the, the temple with false gods that was being uh, ignored because so many of the people were coming to Christ and they started complaining to Paul, we're losing our business, we're losing our money. The silversmiths, the goldsmiths, the tradesmen making these idols out of uh, handmade and Paul is saying, no, these are not gods at all. And they were upset, remember? And so probably somehow Aquila and Priscilla saved Paul's neck in the midst of those riots that were going on in Ephesus. When was the last time you took a risk for the gospel? talking to someone you need to talk to, reaching out to someone, stepping forward to do a ministry God's calling you feel inadequate to do, going to a mission field, giving sacrificially. Let me tell you something. If your Christianity has never moved you to a place where you're uncomfortable, you're probably missing God's direction. We need to risk something, maybe being laughed at, ridiculed. Living in risk makes life exciting. Christianity's exciting. I mean, Paul, he lived a pretty exciting life. Got himself killed eventually, but he did. <laughs> Take a step and risk something. Faith, listen, faith means you're about to do something big and the only way you can do it is with God's help. Risk something. Examples, let me tell you something. When I left my job at Berean 30 years ago this October, I was getting paid a good salary and Pastor Weeks was a great boss and it was a great church and it was hard because I came here with no salary, all right? My wife was working. It was uncertain. I was fearful. I'd never preached a whole lot. And those of you that came early, you know I couldn't preach worth it. Well, basically, don't put me in a wet paper bag because it would bust open. Be, yeah, no, it wouldn't bust open. <laughs> I'd be stuck in there trying to preach my way out. But, you know, that was a risk. The first time I ever gave a large gift to missions, it was very large. That was the risk. My, my heart was beaten. You know, the, 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 the time that I cast out a demon, and I wanted to run the other way, not toward the demon in the name of Jesus. Or the time when I've confronted friends with their path to destruction, knowing that I could lose their friendship, and I have at times, but I knew I had to speak the truth, iron upon iron, letting the sword of the Spirit cut right deep. Or the time that my neighbor in Waco, Texas, got shot, he's laying, and you could hear guns going off, 
And instead of running away or hiding, I ran right to him and began to pray. And my prayer was bold in the name of Jesus and that man lived. Let me tell you, there's risk to be taken. God wants us to step out, not retreat, go forward. And finally, the kingdom of God needs tent makers. Tent makers are people that make their living other ways. All of you could be a truck driver or whatever, a nurse. But you're doing, you're not, you're not on earth to be a nurse or a tent maker. You're on earth to be a minister of the gospel, an ambassador for Christ. That's our title. And I close with this verse. And I'm reading it in the New Living Translation, so it'll be up in the NIV. This means, and he's talking about our, as ambassadors, our, our job to take the gospel of Jesus and saving to everyone. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. Aren't you thankful? Who brought us back to himself through Christ. That brought him back to himself is the word to reconcile, to make us right, to bring us back. He brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people all over, all over, all over the world to him. Reconciling people to him. That's our task that we've been given. Verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say thank you, Jesus? If you have guilt and shame, he won't count it against you. Call on him. Ask him to cleanse you and free you. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. We have the message to bring people back to God, to reconcile, to make things right for people. So we are Christ's ambassadors, an ambassador of not just the United States of America, but of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Representatives as ambassadors, representatives of Jesus Christ with the message of hope. God is making his appeal through us, it says. We speak for Christ when we look at this word, plead up here, I think it says, uh, when we implore you, implore you, plead, pleading with people to come back to God. That's reconciliation. And that's our cry. And Aquila and Priscilla, they're powerful in encouragement to say, I don't care what degree you have. I don't care if you're, quote, unquote, the professional missionary evangelist, professional teacher, or professional pastor. All of us are called and we have a place. Amen? And people need Jesus because he's the hope of the world. And people are afraid right now. And those of you online, Jesus needs you to step up, figure out a way. Get online and minister. Get on the phone and minister. Find out a way to encourage and give the gospel. And don't be afraid to be laughed at because you speak up and say, Jesus Christ is the living word. He is salvation. He's the one and only true God. All other gods are in the grave. They're dead. They're not alive. And Jesus Christ is the only way and his book the Bible is the truth the whole truth all of it and his moral code does not change and his commands to us are yea and amen and we must go forward and do it in the name of Jesus amen on I'll tell you something right now it's important everybody register and vote it's very important but if you don't pray that vote will mean nothing because America is in degradation and sin and depravity and the only hope is a spiritual awakening, a sovereign move of God. And we can talk about prayer and we can know about prayer and we can quote Second Chronicles 7.14. But if we don't turn from our sin and repent and seek His face and His presence and His glory and turn from our wicked ways, we will not see our, hand, our land healed. And so we got to pray, folks. That's it. You hear me? You do whatever else you do, but you pray. We need people to pray. 7 o'clock. Third Tuesday through Friday right here. Come and pray. Be, be a part of Pray at home. You guys at home, pray. We you bow your head with me today? You're scared. You're fearful. Maybe you're not sure if you were die, you'd go to heaven. God's Spirit told me to tell the people not to be afraid. Get right with God. Stay right with God. And don't be afraid. Don't back up. Move forward. Proclaim His name. Do the work of evangelists. Do the work of the gospel. Don't be afraid. Let's do this thing. And you hear, maybe you got fearful. But you close your eyes and bow your head. I see some of you not doing that. It's just respectful to your neighbor. Would you do that? Thank you, everyone. Put your head down. Raise your hand. Say, I, I want to put my hope in Jesus. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not going to be afraid. Some of you say, well, I'm not sure I'm ready for heaven. What if I died of this COVID? I'm not going to go to heaven. If you're watching online, 
I'm telling you, Jesus will take away your sin and change your heart. He'll give you a new desire. He will do all the work. That's what grace means. He will change you and your desire and your heart to follow after him and run after him. And today, if you're just not sure, you need the peace of God. Jesus is that peace. You need blessed assurance. Jesus is that assurance. And you say, you'll raise your hand and say, Jesus, forgive my sin. I want to be right with you. I want to stay right with you. I want to live right with you. I want heaven to be my home someday. And you have a lift your hand and say, that's me. Yes, I see several of you. And thank you for your honesty today. In the name of Jesus, I pray for those, those watching to come into their hearts and change their heart by the power of your grace. The Spirit of God, make them new. Spirit rebirth, change from the inside out. Give them a heart for you and for your word, a desire to pray, a desire for the Bible. Give us hope, Jesus. Your name is hope. Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Thank you for it, Jesus. And I pray you bless your church beyond measure and that we would go forward, not shrink back and not stand still, not put it in neutral. No way. We're going forward in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus. We go forward where demons tremble at the name of Jesus. There's victory in Jesus. There's forgiveness in Jesus. There's life in Jesus. There's healing in Jesus. And for those needing healing, heal them right now in the name of Jesus, whether they're watching or not. Heal them, we pray, for you're powerful and we believe you, God. Amen. Amen.